we believe that God still speaks, God still hears, God still calls. That the deepest longings of our souls are only satisfied in union with its Creator. We believe that God's people should point towards a better way, a brighter future. That perhaps it's the ancient paths that will help us find a road to a better tomorrow. We are a church called to worship, Jesus, the King above all kings. We are a church pursuing family, real, authentic connection. We are a church seeking justice, to see God's way lived out on the earth. We are a church partnering with God to see His kingdom come. We are Grace Capital City. Hey, Grace Capital City, so glad you have joined us for our service today. Special welcome to you if you're a guest, if you're checking out our church for the first time. Really pray that you would be blessed by our service and by our virtual gathering here today. One of the rhythms that we have gotten into during this time of uh, being apart physically is starting off each gathering with a Capital Kids lesson. So this is a really good time. If you have kids, go and grab them, gather them together. I'm going to hand it over now to Miss Kelly for our Capital Kids lesson. Hey kids, happy Sunday. I'm so glad you're here today. Today I'm looking for Troop again. He was supposed to be here to join me, but I don't know where he went. Can you help me find him? Let's yell his name really loud on the count of three, okay? One, two, three. Troop! Troop? Hmm, I don't know where he went. Oh, Troop! You almost ran into me. Oh, uh, hey, Miss Kelly. Hey, kids. Sorry, I, uh, I didn't see you there. Yeah, that's okay, Troop. Um, what, what's with the eye mask? Oh, uh, well, the email said to wear my mask. Yeah, the email, it, we meant a different kind of mask, one that protects your face, not one that you sleep in. Oh, 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 well, I have that one too. I'll go get it, one second. Okay, Troop. Troop, you're back. I'm back, Troop. I see that, wow. Um, Troop, that's also a great mask, but that's not the kind of mask I meant. Oh, uh, well, yeah, I meant the kind that protect your mouth specifically. Oh, I, I don't have that. That's okay, Troop, um, but I wanna see your face. Whew, I can see. That's great, Troop. You know, that's a pretty cool mask. It was a birthday gift. A birthday gift. I love birthday gifts. Me too. You know, that kind of reminds me of when God gave us that really great gift. You know, the greatest gift in the whole world. Mm, no? You don't know which gift I'm talking about? Oh, carrot cake? No, true, not carrot cake. It's better than that. Cheesecake! True, this isn't any kind of cake. This is something way better than cake. The best thing that God ever gave us. Kids, surely you know what I'm talking about. Let's read our memory verse to remind Troop what the greatest gift God ever gave us was. Okay, Troop, read this. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is better than cake. I told you, Troop, it's way better and bigger than cake. Our sin was weighing us down and keeping us away from God. God loves us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to be the sacrifice for us. Jesus beat sin once and for all so that we wouldn't be weighed down anymore and we could be close and live with God forever. 
Woohoo! It's great news, and we can thank God by praising Him and loving others and sharing this news with everyone that we see. Well, I had so much fun with you today, and me and Troop will see you later. Bye, kids! Thank you, Miss Kelly, for that lesson. Hopefully, you kids out there really enjoyed it and were blessed by that teaching. We're going to enter into a time of worship now. And if you were with us last Sunday, you probably heard that we have a new worship pastor. Freddie Washington has joined our church and our staff team as our worship pastor. And so it's an honor and privilege to be able to hand it over to him to lead us in worship. I'm going to pray for us as we prepare our hearts to come into a time of worship. Let's pray. And so, Father, we do. We bless you. We thank you. Lord Jesus, would you be glorified in our gathering today? Father, whether we are in a valley, whether we find ourselves on a mountain, God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would meet us in that place, and that you would lift our eyes again, that we would remember where our help comes from, that we would set our gaze on you, and that we would be strengthened and we would be renewed as we worship you as your church today. So, Father, bless us as we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. We bless your name, Jesus. You're worthy of the glory. You're worthy of the honor. Come on, right where you are at home, why don't you just lift your voice and let's glorify the King of Kings. We bless your name today, Lord. You're worthy of every praise. You're worthy. We raise a hallelujah to your name, Lord. Oh, we bless your name. Come on, let's lift our voices and raise a hallelujah to the King of Kings. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief.
Christ. He is worthy of a hallelujah. Jesus is. Oh, Jesus is. Oh, my Jesus is. Oh, Jesus is. Worthy of a hallelujah. Oh, Jesus is. Oh, Jesus is.
be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Lord, bless you. to you, Lord, turn his face toward you, and give you peace, amen, 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 amen.
strengthened us in this season. Holy Spirit, thank you that you have been our source and our hope and our light. And God, I pray you would just continue to lift our spirits. You would continue to remind us of the eternal hope that we have in you. You continue to remind us of the eternal promise that we have in you. And God, I just pray for anyone right now who's experiencing loneliness, who's experiencing depression, people who have maybe found themselves in a season of just hopelessness. Lord Jesus, would you be ministering to them right now? And God, I pray that our sights would be lifted, our hearts would be lifted, and our spirits would be encouraged in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Freddie. Thank you, Steph, for leading us in worship. We're so blessed to have such an amazing worship team that uh, allows us to enter in, even though we're scattered and virtual, allows us to enter into His presence every Sunday. We're going to enter into our time of giving, and uh, we try to make that as easy as we can. There's a, a giving link that you can click on. It will be in the chat, chat window. It will also be on the, the viewing page that you can click on. And I just want to remind you and encourage you in your giving this Sunday. This is fuel for the local church. That as you give, you don't just give to another organization. You literally give to the body of Christ, the church, the bride of Christ gathered here in this city. And through your giving, we're able to bless the city. We're able to form spiritual family. We're able to disciple people. We're able to press into the mission that God has um, put before us. And so I just want to encourage you in your giving. If you've never given before, Really, I say this would be a spiritual discipline that you would consider praying about, that you would allow this to be part of your rhythm and your growth as a disciple, giving God our first fruits. For those of you who are regular and faithful givers, thank you for the way you've been giving so generously during this time of pandemic and what a blessing it has been to know um, that our body is still gathered in our giving and fueling what God has called us to do as a church. So encourage you in your giving today. 
A couple of quick announcements I want to give you before I hand it over to our speaker for today. The first one is about our Family Fun Day. So that is coming up this Saturday, Saturday, August 29th at 10 a.m. at Quincy Park. We're going to be gathering. It's our Capital Kids team is hosting this Family Fun Day and you are invited. We're going to be having food. There's going to be games for the kids. We have water games. Um, we're going to be doing it in a socially responsible way, so we are asking you to wear a mask. There's a great playground at Quincy Park, really good food, just a really good, fun gathering in an outside environment so it feels safe. If you want to RSVP for that, we would love you to do that. You can email kelly at k-e-l-i at gfc.tv or if that's too hard to remember, you can email gracecapitalcity at gfc.tv. It's just to give us a heads up so we can be ready for having food and be prepared for you to be there. I also want to say if there's families that you know, maybe friends, neighbors that you'd like to reach out to and help get them invited in the community here at Grace Capital City, this can be a great uh, kind of stress-free environment to invite them in. So please feel free to invite them and let us know so we can be prepared for them as well. So that's this Saturday, Saturday, August 29th at 10 a.m. at Quincy Park. Really excited about that. The second thing, is this is an announcement we've been making over the last few weeks and that is that we are starting to invite people in to our live worship and teaching recordings. We know that people are in very different places when it comes to regathering. Some people are very ready and some people are not ready at all. And wherever you are, that's okay to be right there. But we want to create an opportunity for people to self-select, to decide how much you want to re-engage. And so on Thursday night, starting this Thursday night at 7 p.m., to a limited group of people, 50 will be the absolute maximum we're allowing in the building. Um, we are inviting people to participate in live worship. Um, I'll be teaching the message there and then it will be recorded and streamed at our regular Sunday times, which is 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., of course. So if you're interested in attending this Thursday's live recording, you can go to our website and sign up there. You can RSVP there. There's also a link on our Instagram page, um, if you're on your phone, you can do that. Just so you know, we will be taking all the necessary, necessary COVID restrictions. Masks will be required the whole time, social distancing, temperature checks at the door, and um, we're going to be doing this as safely as we can. So that's just something for you to consider. You're invited to come and worship with us this Thursday night at 7 p.m. And we'll be announcing more dates of those moving forward. So having said all that, we have an amazing guest speaker um, today, he is a real friend of Grace Capital City. He has spoken multiple times in our house. Pastor Devin Turner is the founding and lead pastor of Revolution Church in the southeast of Washington, D.C. He's a lead pastor. He also is the founder of the nonprofit Justice and Equality. Um, you may remember him from our last Kingdom Justice conversation. He's a man with not only a great teaching gift, but a prophetic insight and has become a dear friend and brother to me. And so I just asked Pastor Devin to come and teach us today. And um, I think you guys are in for a treat with this word he's going to bring us. So having said that, it's my honor to hand it over for our teaching to Pastor Devin. Good morning, everybody. My name is Devin Turner. I'm blessed to be the pastor of Revolution Church, and I'm so excited to be here with you all this Sunday morning. A uh, special shout out to Pastor Chris. Pastor Chris, thank you for having me. And Grace Capital City, today I want to invite you to my living room. I know the set doesn't look exactly like what you're used to, but welcome to my home. And thank you for welcoming me into you all's time to just be able to share a message of hope with you this morning. Today we're going to be talking about none other than the good news. And so without further ado, I want to take a moment to pray over God's word today, and then we can just dive right in. Let's take a moment to pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, would you just bless this time that we have together? Would you synchronize our hearts and our minds to yours? that our lives will never be the same. Make us more like you as a result of what we hear today. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Well, if you're like me, you could use some good news, right? I mean, everywhere we turn around, there's bad news. There's bad news about the pandemic. There's bad news about political things. There's bad news about social justice things. I mean, it seems like everywhere we look, there's bad news. We had this storm that came through up the East Coast a few weeks ago. The news is often bad. And I remember even growing up uh, as a kid, I used to go with my mom to the grocery store and we would take a look uh, when we get to the register and I would see the candy. And I've always asked for candy and mama say, yes, Devin. Or she'd say, no, Devin. 
And then I would also notice these magazines, right? National Enquirer, Star Magazine. And I say, Mom, look at these. Uh, why are these here? You know, they didn't seem like they were with the other magazines in the uh, magazine aisle over there at the giant food store or wherever I was shopping. And I found myself having this discussion with my mother about these look so different. And my mom explained to me that these news expressions or these platforms or these mediums were not really good news. They were gossip. They were like these tabloids that were fabricated. And I'm like, what's fabricated? So my mom's educating me while she's doot, 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 ringing up everything, right? And I'm having this concept of bad news. And that bad news does not necessarily just mean hearing something that's very, very troubling. Bad news can just be misinformation as well. And so today I want to share some good information and I want to share some good news. And I have a focus point for you all this morning. So Grace Capital City, if you don't remember anything else that we talk about today, I'd like you to remember this. It's going to come on the screen. Reading and understanding the good news is essential because putting my trust in anything else is truly detrimental. Reading and understanding the good news is essential because putting my trust in anything else is truly, truly detrimental. Now, here's one thing we just got to talk about. Grace Capital, I need you guys to walk with me through this concept. Before we can, can move any forward with the gospel message, we need to get an understanding, a mutual understanding of what the gospel or the good news is. So let's get that definition on the screen. The good news is the gospel. It's the good news that all of us were born in sin and deserve to go to hell when we die. But God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us and offer us eternal life. Now. This whole gospel message, we're going to dig into a bit today. But what I want you all to understand is that we got about two more definitions that we need to put up here on the screen just so that we can all track together in the same flow. Let's get the next definition on the screen. The definition of essential is absolutely necessary. Anything that is absolutely necessary is essential. And the definition of detrimental is anything that is damaging or harmful. Now, in our focus point, let's get that back on the screen really quickly. We said, we said that reading and understanding the good news is essential. It is so important. It is so absolutely necessary. And that if we don't put our, I'm sorry, if we don't understand this and we put our hope in anything else, it's truly detrimental. And detrimental by the definition that we just looked at means it's harmful. It means it's damaging. It means it's bad for us. And so now that we have this working definition, let's take a look at the scriptures in Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to take a look at what God has to say about the gospel and about the essential qualities of the gospel and why it's detrimental to put our hope and trust in anything else other than the good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's go. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 11. The Bible says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. Let's stop right there. So the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church at Ephesus, and he's talking to the people that live in Ephesus, and they're called Ephesians. Like you live in America, and you're called Americans. Uh, if you live in Washington, D.C., you're called a Washingtonian. Well, they lived in Ephesus, so they're called Ephesians. So he's talking to the Ephesians, and that's why this book of the Bible is called Ephesians. And what he's telling them is this, hey, you guys used to be a certain kind of way. Before you came to the faith in Jesus Christ, you all were uncircumcised heathens is what the Jews called you, right? They used to call y'all all kinds of names. But now you must understand in verse 11, he said, the circumcision that the Jews had, it only affected their bodies and not their hearts. Now, I won't go into graphic detail as to what circumcision is, but most of y'all should know what that is. But it's the cutting away of something in your genitalia if you're a male. And oftentimes it happens as a baby. Well, Jews had circumcision done to their genitals when they were babies, right? But Gentiles did not. They didn't have the foreskin cut. And they were considered, ew, yucky. You, you got that foreskin, man. And so they were making fun of them. They were dissing them. They were calling them unclean. You're nasty. You're wretched people. Yuck. 
can't stand you. And they were mocking them. And But what the Apostle Paul wanted to encourage the Gentile believers to know is that you don't have to go do anything to your body if you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you've had a circumcision of the heart. Your heart has been clipped in a very healthy way. You are open to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And I want to pause right there because there's some people that get really religious on us and in, in whether they're Christians or non-Christians, self-proclaimed Christians or non-Christians, and they'll know all this information. And they'll be real haughty with all the stuff they can tout around and they can speak different languages and they know these different the theologies. They know all this and that. But when it comes to the way they treat somebody, they treat them so horribly. They don't have any love. There is no compassion. There is no mercy. It's just facts and facts and facts. Well, the Jews were bringing all these facts and accusations against these Christians. They were saved like they were saved. They both professed in Jesus Christ, but because of an ethnic difference and a physiological difference, they mocked them and excluded them. And so maybe you felt excluded because of your skin color, your ethnicity, maybe because of your physicality, something with you. It may not have been circumcision, but something with you that made you feel like an outsider. And people that were supposed to be your brothers and sisters in Christ who were supposed to embrace you didn't. And they drew lines in the sand proverbially to call out and point out the differences. There's hope for you. Our focus point. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. Reading and understanding the good news is essential because putting my trust in anything else is truly detrimental. Let's get back to the passage in Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 13, the Bible says, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the, the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations, he made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Let's stop right there. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, look, it doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. If you have confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, we are united. We are one in Christ Jesus. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And we shouldn't draw lines in the sand, social economic lines. We shouldn't draw geographical lines. Oh, y'all live over there and we live over here. Oh, y'all skin color is this way. Our skin color is that way. Oh, your denomination is this. My denomination is that. We draw all these lines. When the only two lines we should be focused on are the vertical line and the horizontal line. The only two lines we should focus on are the two lines that make the cross because that's what unites us and that's what brings us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's keep going in the scriptures. Verse 16, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this, what is it, Grace? Good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit. Yes, I love that. Because of what Christ has done for us. I love that. I love that. You know, with the political climate in the United States being what it is, we have people that are politically aligned with the donkey, and then we have people that are politically aligned with the elephant, and then we have people that are politically aligned with the independent party, right? And then Kanye West has the birthday party, right? And then there's all these other parties, right? And so what happens is most parties try to say, we are the Christian party and we are the Christian party. All right, no, it's about the donkey. Oh, it's about the elephant. Oh, it's about Kanye's birthday party. Oh, whatever other parties there are. And what we, what a lot of, a lot of parties try to do is to say, this is the one, if Jesus Christ were an American, he would go with this candidate. Right. And what the Bible wants us to understand is that when we're drawing these lines in the sand, ethnically, politically, socially, economically or whatever you want to put on there, 
We are missing the unification in the body of Christ. I've seen Christians argue on social media, going back and forth over who should be president, who should be governor, should I wear a mask, should I not wear a mask? And all we're doing is being a horrible witness. We're not sharing good news with people that are lost in their sin. We're sharing bad news like Star Magazine. We've turned our Instagram, our, our Twitter, our Facebook, our social media, we've turned it into nasty tabloid stuff that people do not want to see. And we say we're doing it in the name of Jesus. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus told his disciples that they will know that you're my disciples by how you love one another. And if we're not loving each other, if we can't agree to disagree peacefully and civilly, what do we just read? Hey, peace to the Jews, right? Peace to the Gentiles. If we can't have peace in the church, how can we expect to bring them to the Prince of Peace, those that are out in the world? Focus point. Grace Capital City. If you don't remember anything else that we talk about this morning, remember this. Reading and understanding the good news is essential because putting my trust in anything else is truly, truly detrimental. Hmm. Let's get back to the scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 1. The Apostle Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this, and here's what he wrote to his spiritual son, Timothy. He said, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead, when he comes to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God, be prepared when the time is favorable or not, patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Hmm. What kind of teaching? Good teaching. Let's keep going. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind. What kind of mind, Grace Capital City? A clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Wow, this is loaded. We're going to break this down in a moment. One more, one more sentence. Work at telling others the good news. Work at telling others the good news. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Woo! That is a loaded passage, Grace, and we're going to dig into it a little bit. Let's expose the text a little bit. Let's go back here. Let's go back to, um, let's go to verse three. Let's take a look at verse three together. Verse three says this, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Let's stop right there. We've had a whole lot of trauma and drama in the United States and around the world around social justice. I have talked to people who are Christians, and some don't believe that social justice exists. Some people believe that social justice is a state of mind, it's secular. Um, some people don't believe that uh, African Americans, for example, are being harshly treated in, in, in these situations we see online. Say, oh, well, you know, um, if the person wasn't a criminal, or if the person had complied with the police, or if the person didn't have drugs in the system, da 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 da, da right? And we see the media do it, right? If you watch Fox News, they'll put one spin on it. You watch CNN, they'll put another spin on it, right? So everybody's got all these spins and spins. It's like little tops spinning around, right? And before we know it, whatever you have a proclivity to, you're going to lean toward that logic. That's just the way it is. We're all looking at the same footage of a person being choked out, a person being shot, or whatever. But if my desire is to follow a narrative of this, there's a news media outlet for this. And if my desire is to follow a narrative of this, there's a news media outlet that's gonna expose this. And so what I'm saying is, is that we have to be careful because that same ideology that we use when we're looking at injustices or when we're looking at anything, we can be looking at a TV show. You have your perspective, I have mine. We take that same approach to the gospel, some of us. And if we're not careful, it's not good news, it's counterfeit news. Right. It becomes this watered down, washed down version of what the Bible teaches. And it becomes this thing that appeals to whatever my itching ears want to hear. 
You know, growing up, I had a skin disease called eczema and, you know, my skin used to itch. And the thing about itching is that when you scratch it, it feels good in the moment, but afterwards it hurts and it's inflamed. When you follow bad teaching, when you follow bad news, when you embrace bad news, when you embrace a thinking and a philosophy that is not godly, but is totally for whatever your desires are in your flesh or in your sinful nature, you can get that itch scratched. Hanging with these people, attending this type of church, watching this kind of news, following this type of social media crowd. But after it, you get that itch, scratch kind of like a dog with the, with the hind leg, kind of hitting, the, you know, your skin gets inflamed. Then it burns. And sometimes if you scratch hard enough, it bleeds. And you wonder, but it felt so good in the moment. But now it's bringing me pain. And oftentimes, anything that's making you itch, if you scratch it enough and it bleeds, it spreads. I know I'm getting graphic, but I'm going somewhere. What's my point? What's your point, Pastor Devin? Being all graphic. What are you talking about, man? Here's what I'm talking about. If you want to spread something, spread the good news. Don't spread false narratives and rhetoric that is not biblically sound just because you got an itching for it. Because whatever you scratch is going to spread. Whatever you entertain, whatever you draw your attention to, it will be exposed and it will spread, whether it's the good news or bad news. Focus point. If you don't remember anything else we talk about this morning, remember this. Reading and understanding the good news is essential because putting my trust in anything else is truly detrimental. I hope y'all are still with me because we got a little bit more to go. We talked about verse three. Let's look at it again. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Verse four, they will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Some of us are afraid of opposing certain ideologies and theologies because we're afraid of what people are going to think of us. We're afraid of suffering for the Lord. Oh, the, what are they going to say if, if, I, if I, I speak out against this thing? I'm really cool with these people. These people are in my social circle. These people are my coworkers. These people are my family members. What if I speak up and speak out against that wrong that they're advocating for? What if I speak up and speak out and say, no, that's not godly. I know it's been in your tradition for a long time. I know it's been in your way of thinking for a long time, but I've come into some un new understanding of what God God's word has been saying for centuries, and I'm saying that we've been wrong. We've treated these people wrong. We've approached this ideology wrong. We've gone about this whole thing wrong. God is giving us a fresh revelation of his grace and mercy. Some of us are afraid to have those conversations with our parents. Some of us are afraid to have those conversations with our siblings, our social circles. We'll be kicked out in no time. We'll be unfollowed on social media. We'll get unlikes. We'll be banned from certain social settings. And some of us care more about our reputation than the gospel's communication. We care more about our status than the state of people's souls. And we'll find ourselves running with what's itching, what's popular, what's hot, what everybody else is saying we should be doing. And we walk around with inflamed, bad drama. The Bible's telling us that we should embrace sound teaching, wholesome teaching, the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and my sins, and that if you put your trust in him, you won't perish, but you'll have everlasting life. Let's keep going in the scriptures. Matthew chapter 7. I'm sorry, let's get a definition of sound really quickly. You say, oh, Pastor Chris, this pastor you brought in, he loves definitions. I do. I love it. Definition of sound, to be well, healthy, free from any mixture of error. When the Bible tells us that we need to get sound, wholesome teaching, we need to have a teaching of God's word that is well, that is healthy, that is free from any mixture of error. Now, nobody's perfect. No pastor's perfect. No church is perfect. And if a church were perfect and you joined that church, well, guess what? That church wouldn't be perfect. So there are no perfect churches. There are no perfect people. There are no perfect pastors. But when a pastor is breaking down scripture, like I'm doing right now through the screen with you all, my, my Capital Grace homies. I want you to understand this, Grace Capital City. My goal is to, 
Teach something that is well, that is healthy and free from mixture or error. My job is to rightly divide the word of truth, to give the unadulterated word of God. Pastor Chris's job, Pastor Pete's job, all the pastors in your church's jobs are to rightly divide the word of truth, to not give you any mixture or error or twist it, but to give you exactly what God is saying and make it relevant to your lifestyle today. Now, with that in mind, let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, I want y'all to check this out, Grace Capital City. The Bible tells us to beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. Uh, I don't know how old you all are, or young you are, but uh, when I was a kid, there was a cartoon. Uh, it was called Looney Tunes, right? And on Looney Tunes, there was the Roadrunner and there was Wiley the Coyote. And Wiley the Coyote, he would try to catch the Roadrunner. Every episode, he tried to catch the Roadrunner, but he could never catch him. He kept shopping at this place called Acme, and the Acme products always blew up in his face, but he kept going back to Acme. I don't know why, but he would. Now, there were times on certain episodes where he would dress up as a sheep, and he would dress up as a sheep, and then he would try to steal a sheep, try to eat a sheep, or try to eat the Roadrunner, but the Roadrunner would always trick him and make sure he didn't eat any sheep or eat him. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because just like that cartoon depicted, there are preachers, there are teachers, there are false prophets, false teachers, false preachers who stand in front of you in a church or on a screen, and they will tell you that they're telling you God's word, but they're in strong error. Here's what the Bible says. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. Look at verse 16. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Hmm. Hmm. Let's stop right there. Pastor Devin, what are you talking about? Well, in Galatians chapter 5, the Bible talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the produce of the Holy Spirit. When you go to the grocery store, you see there's different sections in the grocery store. There's meat, there's poultry, right? There's frozen, there's snacks, right? All types of different aisles. And then there's the produce section, right? A lot of us don't like to go to the produce section. Some of us do. Some of us don't. But the produce section is where vegetation is, where fruit is. It's where things that grow are, are produced from the earth, are sold. and so. Using the metaphor that the Bible gives us about a tree, right? If Jesus is the tree, Jesus gives us a metaphor in the Bible. He says, I am the vine or I am the tree trunk. You are the branches. If you are in me, you will bear much fruit. What fruit? Galatians chapter 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So when the Bible tells us in what we just read, that if you are truly saved, we will know you by your fruit, we will know by how you treat people, by how you behave. People ask me all the time, Pastor Devin, you shared the gospel to so many people. How do you know if they're saved? I say, give them time. Why do you think Jesus gave us an agricultural metaphor? If you throw seed into soil, it takes time for you to see what's going to grow. And the Bible tells us in the parable of the sower that different soils will impact the way the word of God penetrates people's hearts. The Bible gives us the metaphor in the parable of the sower that our hearts are like soil. It says there's good soil, there's a rocky place, you know, there's all types of different soil. And the Bible says the kingdom of heaven is like a dude that had seed. He threw the seed out on the ground. Some of it fell on rocky places. Some of it fell on these kind of places. Some of it fell on the pathway. And some of it fell in good soil. If your heart is good soil and you're open to the gospel, you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. You will believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. At that point, you will be saved. The Holy Spirit will come and dwell inside of you and you will produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control will come from your branches. But if you have not received the gospel, you can sit in church. You can say the sinner's prayer. You can pretend to be a Christian. You can claim to be a Christian. You can know all the scripture in the world. But we will be able to judge you by your actions, by your fruit. If I examine your lifestyle and I don't see any love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, or self-control growing on your branches, that's a good sign 
that you're not connected to the true vine, the vine of life, Jesus Christ. So the Bible's telling us, if you're listening to teaching preachers on television, podcasts, radio, you can't be in person because of COVID-19. But if you're under teaching where these people are not living the stuff they're talking about, and they're always making excuses why they're not following God's word, but they're telling you to do it, these people are false. And the Bible says, beware of them. Focus point. If you don't remember anything else that we talk about this morning, I want you to remember this. Reading and understanding the good news is essential because putting my trust in anything else is truly, truly detrimental. Let's wrap up Matthew chapter 7. Let's go back to verse 20. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Let me pause right here and say this. What we're about to read right now is the scariest passage in the Bible. The book of Revelation has nothing on the next few words that we are about to read. Brace yourself. This is good news, but this part of it is scary. Let's go back to it. Matthew chapter 7, let's look at verse 21 together. Jesus says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me. You who break God's laws. That's the scariest passage in the Bible to me. The reason why is because you got people who are calling him Lord, Lord, and saying, hey, didn't I do this in your name? Didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I preach in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I do miracles in your name? Didn't I go to church every Sunday? Didn't I sing with the praise team? Didn't I give my offerings and my tithes? And the Bible doesn't say that that's some people. The Bible says many, many. That means a lot of people who think that they're saved are not. That means that a lot of people who think that Jesus is their Lord, no, Jesus is not their Lord. He's a God they call on when they're in trouble. He's somebody they give offering to. They sing songs, but they haven't surrendered their lives to him. The passage we just read says, all those who do the will of the Father will enter the kingdom of heaven. But not the people that just say, Lord, Lord. The book of Proverbs says, broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many will find it. But narrow is the path that leads to righteousness. And only a few find it. So I didn't mean to make this a scary message, but maybe I did. The question you should be asking yourself right now is, am I in the many or am I in the few? Focus point. If you don't remember anything else that we talk about this morning, remember this. Reading and understanding the good news is essential because putting my trust in anything else is truly detrimental. We say, Pastor Devin, we just read in the passage that only those who do the will of the Father will enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's look at verse 21 real quick. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but only those who do the will of the Father. We're into the kingdom of heaven. You say, well, Pastor Dan, what's the will of the Father? Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. You'll be saved. And with salvation comes action. Now, you're not saved by actions, but because you're saved, there will be actions. James, the book of James says that faith without works is dead. So if you say you have faith in Jesus, that's cool. But if you don't put any action in that follows that faith, then your faith is meaningless is what the book of James says. Here's a a real practical example. I can have faith that this TV will lift off this, right? 
I can pray. I can shout. I can say, Lord God, I know you have the power to move this TV. I know you have the power to lift this TV screen. But if I don't put forth some action with my faith, then the TV will stay here. I have to lift. I have to put forth effort with my faith. And what I'm telling you is having faith in Jesus Christ, true faith in Christ, will lead you to actions where you want to share this good news with others, will lead you to actions where you're bearing that fruit of the spirit we talked about. Your God is shaping you and molding you and pruning you like, 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 like a branch on a tree where you're bearing more patience. And God puts you in impatient situations to make more patience come out of you. God puts you in situations where you want to show hatred so he can get more love out of you. God puts you in in situations where, where there's a lot of disaster going on so he can get more peace out of you because he's pruning you and he's producing through you so that you can grow in your faith and other people can see the growth and partake of your fruit. I mean, what's the point of growing fruit if people can't partake of it? People need to see you go through drama with your saved self, with your Christian self, and overcome those odds. They partake of your fruit. Wow, she had peace in the midst of that storm. Wow, he showed self-control when he could have lashed out. Wow, he has love in his heart when those people were hateful to him. That's your ministry. That's how you spread the good news. You don't have to be a preacher like Pastor Chris or Pastor Pete or me. You preach with your lifestyle. Our last passage for today, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 says this. I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news. Pretends to be the good news. Verse 7, but is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again what we have said before. If anyone preaches any other good news than the one you, the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Ladies and gentlemen, we have got to stop seeking people's approval. We've got to seek God's approval. On top of all that, let me explain what he means by curse before we go. That word in essence means doomed for destruction or destined for destruction. People who are twisting God's word intentionally People who are saying that God is cool with stuff that he's not cool with, they're intentionally trying to disciple people in a very manipulative way and to get them to be convinced of something that is anti-biblical and anti-Christ. The Bible says that they are doomed or destined for destruction. That's what the word curse means there in the original language that the Bible was written in. And if you are being under the influence of that, and if you are someone who is teaching that, you are destined for destruction. And everybody who is following that teaching is also destined for destruction. That's the bad news. But the good news is that God loves you. John 3, 16. He sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So with my 15 seconds left, I say, Pastor Devin, how do I apply this to my life? Here's our next step. And I hand it back over to Pastor Chris. Read, pray, learn, share. Read your Bible on a regular basis. Pray for interpretation. <laughs> Learn more about God and share that good news with whoever you know. Let's take a moment to pray. Father God, I pray that you would bless all of us right now. Thank you so much for speaking to us about the true essence and how important the gospel is. And we pray right now that you would touch our hearts, oh Lord, that we would apply this message to our lives, that we would truly confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives, that we would truly believe in our hearts that you, God, raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And not only will we be saved, but that we would also be disciples who move in that salvation to help spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you and we praise you and we say this prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Grace Capital City, God bless you. Pastor Chris, back to you.
Pastor Devin, thank you for that word. I pray you have been blessed. I pray you've been encouraged. I pray that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you as Devin's been ministering to us. So with that said, we're going to have our prayer rooms open. If you want some further ministry, you can click on a link for our prayer rooms. There are people from our ministry team that would love to minister to you and pray with you. You're invited to do that. But go in peace. May, may his favor be upon you. May the face of the Lord Jesus Christ shine upon you. And may you know that you are a daughter and a son of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, amen. We love you guys. We bless you. If you want prayer, remember to click on that link. Otherwise, we'll see you soon.